You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the podcast. This is part two of a two-part episode called 50 Random British Facts, True or False Quiz with James. And this is part two. So if you haven't heard part one, go back and listen to that. It's the previous episode. In this one, we're going to go through the rest of the random facts about Britain, which my brother and I put together earlier this year. Just a reminder of the way this works. First, James and I will read out some more random facts about the UK. Some of the facts are true and other facts are not true. They were completely made up by James and me. You have to decide which facts you think are true and which ones are false. Now, in some cases, it should be really obvious because some of these facts are ridiculous. But watch out because some of these things are perhaps more true than you might imagine. Even though they sound ridiculous, some of them are actually true. So anyway, you have to decide which ones are true and which ones are false. Then, after reading out the facts, James and I will reveal the answers and we'll also discuss each fact a little bit. Hopefully, you can learn some odd and interesting bits of information about the UK, spot some useful English vocabulary, generally practice your listening skills and have a bit of fun in the process. If you'd like to work on your pronunciation, if you want to kind of push this a bit further and work on your pronunciation with this, here's a challenge. Try reading the facts out loud, like James and I did. When you read them out, try to say them clearly and fluently, emphasising the right words, connecting parts of the sentence and adding pauses and intonation in the right places. It's actually quite difficult, but a good exercise. If you want to find the facts so you can read them out, you can find them all on the page for this episode on my website. You'll find a link in the description. Or you will see the facts on the screen if you're watching the YouTube version and you could just kind of like use the YouTube version to find those sentences and read them out loud. Okay, and you could compare the way that you say the sentences to the way James and I say them and perhaps try to copy us or shadow us, that means actually speak the sentences at the same time that we say them. That could be a good way to push your English a bit further with this episode if you're just looking for another way to focus on your English in a more direct and active way, you could try doing that. As I said at the beginning of the first part of this double episode, James and I recorded this in August 2022 and that was before the Queen died in September. And so this is a bit anachronistic sometimes as we talk about the Queen in the present tense as she was still alive and still the head of state of the country at the time we recorded this. So just keep that in mind while you're listening to this, I guess. Oh, and by the way, listen out for a cameo appearance by my daughter somewhere in the middle of the episode. Right, so are you ready to keep calm and carry on? Okay then, here we go with more random British facts. Are they true or are they false? Okay, and we're back then. So um, we're now going to continue with section number three in this very stupid quiz about British facts. And we continue with number 26. This is part three, James. Is this the third and final part? The third and penultimate part. Right, okay. In 1657, England's puritanical leader Oliver Cromwell passed a law making it illegal to serve richly flavoured food, believing it to be a pathway to sin. Number 26. In 1657, England's puritanical leader Oliver Cromwell passed a law making it illegal to serve richly flavoured food, believing it to be a pathway to sin. Number 27. It is illegal to enter the Houses of Parliament wearing a suit of armour. It is illegal to enter the Houses of Parliament wearing a suit of armour. 
Number 28. It is illegal to put a stamp with the Queen's head on it upside down on a letter or envelope. It is considered treason. Number 28. It is illegal to put a stamp with the Queen's head on it upside down on a letter or envelope because it's considered treason. Number 29. It's customary in Britain to let out a little bit of gas when you accept something which has been offered to you. A small fart or a burp. Keep some gas in reserve for moments like this. This is why English people eat beans. It's customary to let out a little bit of gas when you accept something which has been offered to you. A small fart or a burp. Keep some gas in reserve for moments like this. This is why English people eat beans. Okay, number 30. Loch Ness is the largest body of fresh water in Britain by volume. It also keeps a temperature of 6 degrees centigrade all year round, not even freezing in the coldest of Scottish winters. Number 30. Loch Ness is the largest body of fresh water in Britain by volume. It also keeps a temperature of 6 degrees all year round, not even freezing in the coldest Scottish winters. Loch Ness, listeners, right? You know Loch Ness, it's a lake in Scotland, famous for the Loch Ness Monster. Mm -hmm. But is it the largest body of fresh water in Britain by volume? And does it keep a temperature of six degrees all year round, not even freezing in the sco- in the coldest no in the coldest Scottish winters? Number thirty-one. More than half of the London Underground train network, in fact, runs above ground. Hmm. More than half of the London Underground network, in fact, runs above ground. 32. People in the UK speak six languages, not including ones that have been introduced in the last 100 years or so. Wait, 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 wait. Say that again, but more slowly. 32. I don't really understand the question. People in the UK speak six languages, not including ones that have been introduced in the last 100 years ago. So, well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be better to say there are six official languages of the UK? Okay, there are six native UK languages. Okay, in the native, UK? not official, but. Yeah, there are, there are six languages in the UK. There are six languages in the UK. Six. There are six what official native 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 languages in the UK. Shall I read that again then? No, I, I want to keep these bits in. All right. OK. Uh, OK. All right. So there we go. Six official native languages to the UK in no, the UK. In the UK. Number 33. Queen Elizabeth II was born in the same room that Charles Dickens died in. Charles Dickens died in the same room that Queen Elizabeth II was born in. Hmm. Number 34. Recent studies found that skin from British people was more resilient to water compared to that of continental people due to higher levels of wax residue found on the skin's surface. By the way, you said... uh, 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 you, you said something else. You didn't say resistant. You, somehow you came up with another word that was an equivalent word. But Let me try it again. Okay. Number 34. Recent studies found that skin from British people was more resistant to water compared to that of continental people due to higher levels of wax residue found on the skin's surface. So we've got, you know, slightly waxier skin, which is why we are more resistant to water, especially rainwater. True or false? Yeah. Uh, Number 35. The Glasgow accent is so strong that people there often have trouble understanding each other when they speak. The Glasgow accent is so strong that people there often have trouble understanding each other when they speak. Number 36. Number 36. Taxis are obliged to carry a bale of hay in the boot, thanks to old laws regarding the feeding of horses. That's number 36. Taxis are obliged to carry a bale of hay in the boot, thanks to old laws regarding the feeding of horses. A bale of hay? It's like a sort of a big lump of uh, dried uh, grass that might be found in a farm or in a... In a um uh, one of those big big buildings you get on farms, um, you know, a converted barn. That's a, a barn, you know, in a farm. Farm, 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 barn, barn in a farm. Bale of hay. Uh, taxis are obliged to carry a bale of hay in the boot thanks to old laws regarding the feeding of horses. Hay is the sort of stuff that horses might eat. 
Okay. <clears throat> and number 37, this is the penultimate one in this part. The Queen doesn't have a passport. The Queen does not have a passport. And 38. Number 38. The Queen, again, owns all the swans in the UK. And as a result, it is illegal to kill or eat them. Number 38. The Queen owns all the swans in the UK. And as a result, it is illegal to kill or eat them. True or false? The Queen owns all the swans in the UK. What? I want you to... So, um, uh, my daughter, whose name will be not me- will not be mentioned, um, has, has come in and uh, has just quickly interrupted us. We're going to ask you a couple of questions. Okay? I want you to tell me if this is true or false. Okay? True or not true. Um, the Queen does not have a passport... She doesn't have a passport. Do you have a passport? E- yes. How many passports do you have? One. Oh, you've got more than that. Two. Yes, you do. Uh, you've got a British one and... A French one. Right. I've got a passport, a British one. Now, the Queen, does she have a passport? You think she does? Well, the answer is no, she doesn't. So the Queen doesn't need a passport. Yeah. Because she, she doesn't just, need one. It's, she's the queen. She just goes, look. She goes, look, it's me. Don't you know who I am? I'm the, the queen. queen. Thanks very much. I think you, I think uh, I don't need a passport. She doesn't have one. Um, and the next one, uh, you know what You know what swans are, right? Where do you see swans? Uh, on the... River. On the river, right. What colour are they? White. Right, so uh, the queen owns all the swans in Britain. Is this true or not true? Not true. Really, you think? Well, surprise, surprise, it's true. Yeah, the Queen owned... It's like, can't touch that swan. That that belongs to the Queen. Yeah, so it's actually Weird, true. Isn't it? Amazing, isn't it? Yes, that's right. And this is this is why it's illegal to, to kill them and especially illegal to eat them. So I know you're thinking about it, but I know you were thinking about it, but don't eat any swans. All right, I know you were thinking about it, but don't eat a swan, okay? Because the queen will be like, who's been eating all my swans? This little girl, right, take her to the Tower of London immediately. Okay, so there you go, that's it. You can go back downstairs now, yes. We won't be long. We won't Jamie be long. and I are going to be joining you in just a moment, okay? Can you just stay here and watch your mm, th- I think you'll get bored too easily. I don't think so, I, think so. I don't think so, no. No, no. You got to we go. We won't be long. You got to go. We won't be long. Uh, we need to go through those things and quickly, very quickly, say if they're true or not true. Okay, you okay. ready? Yeah, so I'm ready. In 1657, England's puritanical leader Oliver Cromwell passed a law making it illegal to serve richly flavoured food, believing it was a pathway to sin. This is false, although it could have been a reason why. People say English food isn't very good, but it's just not true. He's the kind of thing he would have done. He was a right bastard. Yeah, this is um, during the time of the English Commonwealth, which was when we had no uh, king or queen. The Commonwealth? That's what it was called. The Commonwealth of England. Yeah, the Commonwealth of England. I was right. The Commonwealth uh, was the political structure during the period 1649 to 1660 when England and Wales, later along with Ireland and Scotland, were governed as a republic after the end of the Second English Civil War and the trial and execution of Charles I. The republic's existence was declared through an act of declaring England to be a Commonwealth, adopted by the Rump Parliament on the 16th of May 1649. So this was when Oliver Cromwell was the leader of the Commonwealth of England, um, when England was England and Wales was briefly uh, a republic. So Oliver Cromwell was a puritanical, which meant that he didn't believe in any kind of personal enjoyment or pleasure, considering all of it to be sinful. And so lots of things were banned, including uh, going outside and doing anything on a Sunday. You had to stay indoors. Uh, children playing outside was was. Um, Children playing outside on on a Sunday was illegal and lots and lots of other things. But no, he didn't ban uh, nicely flavoured food. Um, No, so that's not true. Number 27, James. Number 27, illegal to enter the Houses of Parliament wearing a suit of armour is true. 
a suit of armor. This is a big metal suit that you might wear if you're having a big fight with swords, you know, uh, like King Arthur or something. Uh, it is true to enter the Houses of Parliament wearing a suit of armor, and that's probably a very old law. Uh, number 28, it's illegal to put a stamp with the Queen's head on it upside down on an envelope because it's considered treason. Uh, this is false. Uh, the Treason Felony Act of 1848 makes it an offence to do any act with the intention of deposing the monarch. So it's 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 a crime to do anything that will um, uh, remove the king or queen from the uh, throne. But it seems unlikely that placing a stamp upside down fulfills this criterion. The Act, the uh, Treason Felony Act itself, does not refer to stamps. So it's uh, people say that sometimes, that putting a stamp upside down is illegal, but it's not true. Number 29, it's customary to let out a little bit of gas when you accept something which has been offered to you is completely ridiculous and not true at all. But you know what? That's that is that's. Um, the origin of this whole episode. Do you know that? Because I was at your house, your house, I was in your flat. And um, I think I gave something to you like a cup of tea and you did let out a little fart when I gave it to you. So you made that up as a fact. And it just thought, I thought to myself, imagine if that was true, that that was a custom in the UK where instead of saying tar or thanks, you can just, you know, just, you can just, just let one go as a way of saying thanks. I'm not a fan of this toilet humor. No, let's move on. Number 30, Loch Ness is the largest body of fresh water in Britain by volume. It's uh, This is true. So Loch Ness is the largest amount of water, you know, the largest body of water in the UK. Uh, and uh, it does stay above freezing temperature all year round because it's so deep. Cold water... Um, Basically, because it's so deep, the temperature of the water never um, stays the same, and um, so it's never allow, it's never able to freeze. And this is one of the again one of the reasons why people believe it's possible that there is a monster or something living in there because the the water never freezes. Um, so that is actually true about it uh, being a large body of water that never freezes. So that's true. Number thirty one. Uh, more than half of the London Underground network runs above ground. This is actually true. Lots of the London Underground trains do run above ground, like large sections of the uh, Central Line to the west, for example, and lots of other parts of the Underground network are actually above ground. It, nevertheless, it's still called the Underground. Number 32, I'm run, running through these really quickly. Number 32, there are a six official native languages in the UK. This is true. English, Scottish Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, Welsh, Cornish, uh, which is in Cornwall, and Manx, which is on the Isle of Man. Uh, okay, it's the Manx language. So I've just said the sentence about uh, the six native languages, English, Scots, Gaelic, Irish, Gaelic, Welsh, Cornish, and Manx. A lot of those are obviously not very widely spoken, but they are uh, official uh, languages in the UK. Very interesting. Huh. Number 33, Queen Elizabeth II was born in the same room that Charles Dickens died in, is actually false. Uh, it sounds good, but it's just this, it's just false. <laughs> it just didn't happen. Number 34, uh, recent studies found that skin from British people was more resistant, not resilient, but resistant to water compared to that of continental people, meaning people from the European continent, due to higher levels of wax residue found on the skin surface. That's obviously false. <laughs> Uh, uh, James is, is where it is, has put on a hat. Um, I get the feeling you're slightly distracted now. Uh, he's put on a hat that he found in um, in this room and has said, oh, it's quite Indiana Jones, this. So you can imagine I'm now doing a podcast with Indiana Jones, or could that be Indiana James? Uh, um, so next... Um, the Glasgow accent is so strong that people there often have trouble understanding each other when they speak. I think that's a bit iffy. Well, the reason I put that in is because every now and then on this podcast, if I have someone who's got like a different accent, I sometimes will get a comment from someone saying, are they even speaking English? Or this accent is horrible or something like that, which I find really uh, wrong. Um, and so I've put this one in as a sort of another trick question, as if to say... Well, of course, that's not true, because um, although 
from the perspective of a learner of English, an accent from Glasgow might be difficult to understand and might be, quotes unquote, impossible to understand. I mean, that's just not true because in Glasgow, everyone talks to each other and they communicate without any problems whatsoever. So um, it's all relative. So this is obviously false. And the idea that in Glasgow, people can't understand each other is, is, is ridiculous. There you go. Indeed. Okay. Indeed, indeed. Uh, number 26, I'm 36, I'm reading all of these out while Indiana Jones here just sort of like... Uh, lolls uh, around in his chair. Lolls around in his chair, fondling his whip. Uh, Taxis are obliged to carry a bale of hay in the boot thanks to old laws regarding the feeding of horses. That's something people used to say as a fact. They'd say, oh, did you know that? that in, uh, and actually an old law says that taxis have to carry a bale of hay in the boot because of old laws about horses. It's false. But this law did used to be true, kind of. The London Hackney Carriage Act 1831 states that cab drivers cab drivers faced a 20 shilling fine for not providing provisions for their own horses. So there used to be a law which basically said that cab drivers had to uh, provide food for their own horses, but uh, obviously that doesn't apply anymore. Number 37, the Queen doesn't have a passport. We've already uh, established this true. And the Queen owns all the swans in the UK, and as a result, it's illegal to kill them or eat them is also true. True. We've got another round. We've got another Bloody round. Bloody hell, should we crack on with this? Yeah, let's crack on. Can I do this first one? Okay, go for it. 39. Let's, let's, well, hold on a minute. This is round four, the final round, as we continue with number 39. Number 39. The department store Harrods sold cocaine until 1916. The department store Harrods sold cocaine until 1916. Hello, uh, is this Harrods? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'd like some cocaine, please. Certainly. <laughs> okay, That'll there you go. That'll be 20 pounds, please. <laughs> Number That'll be 3p, please. Number 40. The name of the UK's flag is the Union Jack. The name of the UK's flag is the Union Jack. And uh, eagle-eared uh, listeners will uh, will have already noticed that that's already been answered in a previous section by my brother. He, he let the cat out of the bag earlier on uh, with that one. So the name of the UK's flag is the Union Jack. Is that true or not true? Okay, number 41. The word soccer originally comes from the UK. True or false? The word soccer originally comes from the UK. Number 42. There are six ravens. These are like large birds, a bit like crows. Right, There are six ravens which live at the Tower of London, in London, and an old royal decree from the reign of King Charles II states that if one of them leaves, the kingdom will fall. There are six ravens, six large black birds, which live at the Tower of London, in London, and an old royal decree from the reign of King Charles II states that if one of them leaves, the kingdom will fall. True or not true? Number 43. During the time of Henry III, mid-13th century, a live polar bear was kept in the moat at the Tower of London. Number 43. During the time of William III, which was the mid-13th century, a live polar bear was kept at the moat in the Tower of London. Uh, a moat is a large sort of, almost like a river of water that goes around a castle. And the Tower of London is a old medieval castle in uh, in London. And is it true or not that a li alive, not dead, mm -mm, a live polar bear was kept in that moat at the Tower of London uh, in the mid 13th century? True or not true? Number 44. There are more than 70 beaches in the UK. There are more than 70 beaches in the UK. That's beaches, not... Okay. Number 45. There are now more parakeets in London than pigeons. Number 45. There are now more parakeets in London than pigeons. Parakeets, they're like sort of little green parrots. Number 46. There is a secret underground tunnel which runs directly from Buckingham Palace to number 10 Downing Street. There is a secret, well, not secret anymore. There is an underground tunnel which runs directly from Buckingham Palace to number 10 Downing Street. True or untrue? 
Number 47, under the Salmon Act of 1986, it is an offence to handle a salmon suspiciously. Number 47, under the Salmon Act of 1986, it is an offence to handle a salmon suspiciously. Salmon, that's salmon, okay? Salmon. Sa sal fish. Salmon, not salmon, no, salmon, the fish. Number 48, until the late 70s. It was common practice for doctors to recommend that pregnant women drink Guinness because the high iron content was thought to be beneficial for the pregnancy. Number 48. Until the late 1970s, it was common practice for doctors to recommend that pregnant women drink Guinness because the high iron content was thought to be beneficial for the pregnancy. Guinness is a type of beer. Number 49, James. Number 49. Until 1968, tobacco was commonly included in a child's packed lunch, along with bread, fat drippings and tripe. Number 49. Until 1968, tobacco was commonly included in a child's packed lunch, along with bread, fat drippings and tripe. <laughs> Number 50. This is the last one. Okay, all those skeletons with headphones... Here we go. Number 50. Is this true or not true? Until 1982, all buses and taxis were legally obliged to carry a bottle of brandy to revive any passengers taken ill during the journey. Until 1982, all buses and taxis were legally obliged to carry a bottle of brandy to revive any passengers taken ill during the journey. So and that's the last one. That's it. A Let, lot of these were about royalty and booze. Royal. Well, that's the that's Britain in a nutshell, isn't it? Well, not really. But royalty and booze. I suppose they're quite cliched kind of fact subjects. I suppose so. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's you know that's royalty, that, wild animals, booze, and um, rats. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. So, you know, you always get the real side of British life and culture on this yeah. podcast. All right, should we crack yeah, on and crack. Get, these, get these done? Number 39, the department store Harrods. You know, Harrods, that big famous department store in Knightsbridge in London. The department store Harrods sold cocaine until 1916. This is, in fact, true. Um, in London, in 1916, Harrods um, sold a kit like a maybe like a yeah a kit like a like a medical kit described as a welcome present for friends at the front containing cocaine morphine syringes and needles the front being the first world war the um yeah so this was i suppose for soldiers coming home from the first world war um they could be given this kit as a as a a welcome present is it welcome home from the war? Here's know. some cocaine and morphine. Or did they send it to the front? Or did, maybe they sent it to the soldiers. Well, I didn't know it was that extreme with syringes and needles and stuff, but I knew you could buy it in sweets and soft drinks and, well, not soft drinks, hard drinks, clearly. But, um, <laughs> you know, everyone knows Coca-Cola used to have cocaine in it. Did you know that 7-Up used to have lithium in it? 7-Up the... Really? Isn't seven, wasn't 7-Up a, like a Nazi uh, drink? Don't think so. No, that's Fanta. Sorry. Fanta was a Nazi drink. Oh, okay, here we go. Here we go. But yeah, lots of stuff Fanta. used to have cocaine in it. You could buy it in sweets, chocolates, all sorts of stuff. Okay. Fanta. Fanta was created for Nazi Germany. The soda was made from <laughs> apple fibres and a cheese byproduct. This is from uh, atlasobscura.com. Um, it's February 1944, and Berlin is attempting to recover from American aerial bombing. But life and industry continues on the city's outskirts. In farmhouses, bottles clang, and a mix of ex-convicts, Chinese labourers and other workers fill glass bottles of what was likely a cloudy brownish liquid. This is one of Coca-Cola's makeshift bottling operations, and they are making Nazi Germany's signature beverage. Even during war, Germans want their their Fanta. 
The soft drink Fanta was invented by Coca-Cola, an American company inside of Nazi Germany during World War II. Developed at the height of the Third Reich, the new soda ensured the brand's continued popularity. Fanta became a point of nationalistic pride and was consumed by the German public from the Fraus cooking at home to the highest officials of the Nazi party. So essentially, this was a way for for this most American of, of companies to produce a soft drink which the Nazis could really um, get behind. Get behind. Because where while Coca-Cola was the all-American drink, Fanta apparently was the Nazi equivalent. And uh, and they were both made by the same company. Well, well, Great. well, Did well, you know well. that Adidas and Puma were both uh, brothers, Adolf Dassler and Rudy Dassler, they split into two different companies. They were both Nazis. They were both National Socialists and served in the Nazi Party. Yeah. And they went on to start Adidas and Puma, respectively. Wow. Adolf Dassler is what Adidas stands for. Right. So all those Americans saying Adidas, it's Adidas. Adidasler. Right. So you're wrong. <laughs> and you're wearing Nazi shoes. <laughs> um, okay. I wear Adidas, just for the record. Yeah. Yeah, me too, me too. I have some Adidas. I mean, they're not, I don't think they're Nazis anymore. But I don't I, think so. Uh, anyway, let's stop talking about that. Let's, 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 let's leave it Leave it in the, in the history. Let's, yeah, in the, yeah, that's past now, isn't it? <laughs> so let, um, we, uh, let's stick to just talking s- stupid shit about the UK and let's leave the other countries out of it for a while. It's generally, uh, 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 as a general rule of thumb, that tends to work for me, I find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't, whatever, don't tread on anyone else's, you know... Lawn. Yeah, I Just can say whatever I want to piss, say. About piss on your own fire. <laughs> piss on your own lawn. Piss on a- your own lawn. Just don't piss on anyone else's lawn. Yeah, that's right. As a general rule of thumb for life, folks. Yeah, but I do find that if I, I can say whatever I want about the UK, I can I mean, say go, yep. any shit I want, yep. and people Your food are like, oh, is "This terrible. is wonderful." You're bad people. Everyone's just stuffing uh, popcorn into their faces, yeah. and then as soon as I say one thing about another country, I had then- a bad sandwich in Berlin once. You bastard. <laughs> Just because of a bad sandwich in Berlin. Um, actually, it's not the Germans, I have to say, who will... The, I, I actually find the Germans to be quite up for a bit of piss-taking. Um, yeah, but maybe not in the in, to that degree. No. Anyway, let's move on to uh, this. The name of the UK's flag is the Union Jack, James. Of course that's true. Everyone knows that's no, true. No, it's not. What? That's not true. It's not the Union Jack. It's actually more the Union bo- flag. It's the Union flag. Why so did- where did the Jack come from then? Oh. Who was Jack? Who was this Union Jack? And this imposter. Oh 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 oh! This is from Royal dot uk. Um, okay, no, let's go for the Flag Institute dot org. Uh, what do you call the UK's national flag? Vexillologists know that either name is valid. Ah. So you, get, you tell you what, listeners, you get you get bonus. You can get a point if you said false, or you get a point if you said true. Okay, it's either name is valid. Um, Union flag or Union Jack. Oh, there's a brief history. Do we want to go into this? Okay. But where did the word Jack come well, from? That's all. When I want first to know. introduced in 1606, the Union Jack was simply known as the British flag or flag of Britain, and was ordered to be flown from the main masthead of all English and Scottish ships, warships, and merchant ships. The name Union first appears in ni- in 1625. But what of the term Jack? Various theories exist, but the bulk of evidence in indicates use of the word in its diminutive sense. Before 1600, Jack was certainly used to describe a small flag flown from the mast mounted at the end of the bowsprit. So uh, Jack is actually the name of a small flag. By 1627, a small version of the Union flag, later described as the Jack, uh, Jack flag or King's Jack, seems to have flown commonly in this position. And by 1674, this flag was described formally as His Majesty's Jack and in common usage officially acknowledged as the Union Jack. So that's probably enough that uh, it seems that Jack... So like a Jack is a small flag. Yeah, so... So technically it's the Union flag, not the Union Jack. And that uh, Jack is the is like saying the Union Jack... Is, the Union Jack is like saying the Union flag, small version. Yeah. Uh, but these days they seem to... Uh, any Union flag can also be called the Union Jack. Well, there you go. 
Next. Number 40, Juan, James. 40, Juan. The word soccer originally comes from the UK. Can't be true. Everyone knows that comes from America. Soccer. You guys are playing soccer. You guys like soccer, right? Um, uh, And then British people were like, actually, it's not soccer. It's football. It's called Regulation Association Football. Because you you see the clues in the name, football, ball, foot, football. No, we invented the word soccer as well. But no, the British did come up with the word soccer as well because of association football. You've got different types of football, rugby football and association. Association. Soccer. Sock football. Soccer. Soccer. Hmm. Soccer from a so S O C in association S O C soccer soccer soccer, so it's actually a British word as well. But the Americans uh, do call it still call it soccer for the most part. Um, and if when British people go, oh, it's not soccer, it's football, then um, they can be uh, proven wrong by the fact that actually soccer soccer is a British word. Which no American would say because they were like, oh, what? Football? No. Number 42. There are six ravens which live at the Tower of London and an old royal decree states that if one of them leaves, the kingdom will fall. This is true. What's a royal decree, though? A royal decree is a law, isn't it? Well, surely it's just a prediction, not a, not a law. A it's statement. Just like, like if one of them leaves, oh, betide, if one of these leaves, the, the kingdom will fall. It's not like if one leaves, we're going to destroy the kingdom. You know, what are they going to They're going to say, it's not like a rule, is it? Yeah, I suppose the royal decree... The, the, is that the, they shouldn't be less than six of them at any time. A decree is a law, uh, an order, an order which says this must be done or this must not be done. That's a royal decree. When the king says, uh, uh, no ice cream in Britain anymore, Poof, that's a royal decree. But um, I don't know why that would be but why would it be a decree to say that there has to be six ravens or the kingdom will fall i think he's saying if you if you take a raven i'm going to destroy my own kingdom he's not going to do that i think that the decree is there must always be six ravens at the the, uh, tower of london and the reason is well because if they're if not then the kingdom will fall it's not if I know, one I know, of the ravens know, goes, then we must destroy the I'm kingdom. I'm just being awkward because yeah. I'm just saying, well, what's going to happen? What happens? A royal decree would be, oh, whatever, let's move on. I don't <laughs> care anymore. But it's true. Um, it's just one of those, it's just a fun fact. It's just a fun fact that uh, uh, there always have to be six ravens. And you know what, listeners, you know what? Those six ravens are there. And you know how they make sure they don't leave. They're, They're actually, chained. They're not chained. Their cl- wings are clipped. Their wings are clipped, so they can't actually fly away. But one thing about the the Tower of London and the beef eaters and all that, beef the eaters. Queen's Guard, yeah, people tourists kind of think that they're like in fancy dress or something and that they're there for their entertainment. These guys are hardcore service worn soldiers, army, army dude soldiers. Yeah, that you have, you have to have quite a lot of uh, actual experience. You have to have served abroad and, you know, done yeah. killing and stuff. You know, they're all like... These are batten, battle-hardened, battle-hardened, badass killers. British soldiers who've killed many men. And they're not to be effed with. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to the Tower of London or something, have some respect. Otherwise, they're going to shout at you and uh, mm. might kill you. Yeah. They, they By royal decree, they are allowed to just murder anyone they want to without uh, facing any kind of uh, recourse or punishment. Well, there's a few clips That's not of true. That's not true, listeners. No, there's a think. few clips of people on YouTube kind of baiting them, trying to get a response out of them. And then one guy nearly gets trampled, actually. He doesn't get out of the way when they're marching across the yard. And they just shove him really hard out of the way. Some little tourist with a backpack. It's quite funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a really good uh, YouTube video of a... A beef eater. The beef eater is the na- nickname of these royal guards. That they wear these... the bearskin hats. Uh, the beef eaters wear bearskin hats. Oh, let's that's not royal, get started. That's royal that. guards. But anyway, there's a there's an interesting video on YouTube of a beef eater giving a a speech at the house uh, at the Tower of London, and he's very funny and very yeah. I've seen that video. It's good, isn't it? It's great. Uh, number forty three. Uh, do you want to do this one, Jimbo? During the time of Henry the Third. Mid 13th century, a live polar bear was kept in the moat at the Tower of London. True. This is true. It was given to the King of England, King of Britain, by the King of Norway. Although it was kept muzzled and chained, the bear was allowed to swim and hunt for fish at the Thames, and a collar and stout cord 
or chain or something was attached to the bear to keep it from escaping. So this this polar bear was there, kept uh, at the Tower of London, um, and it was every now and then it was allowed to swim out into the River Thames to catch fish, uh, and it was held on a leash, a bit like a, a long dog leash, uh, and so it was allowed to swim out with this leather cord attached to its neck, going out swimming, <laughs> trying to catch fish. Amazing. You did unpause this, didn't you? Yes, I did. <sighs> Just had a little uh, <laughs> moment of uh, severe podcast anxiety there, where I thought that maybe I, I've just we've just recorded, we've just been doing half an hour of this without recording it, but oh, I did unpause it, so everything's okay. Um, right, we're we're getting dangerously close to the end here. Few, yeah. Um, number forty-four. There are more than seventy beaches in the UK. Beaches, yes, true, true. Moving on, number forty-five. Forty-five. There are now more parakeets in London than pigeons. Patently not true. It's obviously false. Um, but there are a lot of parakeets. There are about 50,000 parakeets in London now, apparently. They're little green parrots, and they used to just be in a few parks in West London, and they've spread throughout the whole city now, really, pretty much. Every park has its parakeets, and they're cute, but also quite annoying. Quite invasive, quite uh, they are, a- aggressive they, species. They are, they are aggressive invaders. They, they, they will probably push out other bird species. And squirrels. But yeah. I don't really care about the squirrels, to be yeah. honest. There's a there, there's a one story that you know people aren't sure where they come from or how they arrived. But one story is that Jimi Hendrix, when he lived in London, kept a parakeet or a pair of parakeets as as pets. And one day he he opened the cage and released them out of the window, and then they bred. And um, so they're all down to Jimi Hendrix. So Complete to, bollocks. It's, yeah, <laughs> I think that's not true. That story, but it's quite a nice story. <laughs> it's a good though. story. Number forty six. There is a secret underground tunnel, well, let's say there is a underground tunnel, which runs directly from Buckingham Palace to number 10 Downing Street. Uh, this is true. There you go. I'll say no more. Let's just keep moving. But, oh, fancy that. There is an underground tunnel that connects uh, number 10 Downing Street, the home of the Prime Minister, with uh, Buckingham Palace. Oh, fancy that. Number, number 47, 47, under the Salmon Act of 1986, is an offence to handle a salmon suspiciously. That's not as in you're not like holding under your coat. Well, it could what be. What does that mean, handling a salmon suspiciously? I don't know, but it just means if they think you've stolen it. Right, but it could also mean, I don't know what, like the way you're handling the salmon? Handling this, if you're holding it by its ghoulies or something. <laughs> they don't have ghoulies. <laughs> don't, Let's salmon, move on. Wait, salmon don't have ghoulies? Let's move on. How do they reproduce if they don't have ghoulies? With extreme difficulty. Yeah. So and this is actually true. The Salmon Act of 1986 is a, um, a United Kingdom Act of Parliament, a law, which outlines legislation that covers legal and illegal matter within the salmon farming and fishing industries. Among the provisions of the Act, it makes it uh, illegal to handle salmon in suspicious circumstances. Uh, so not exactly the same thing as handling salmon suspiciously, but in suspicious circumstances, which is defined in law as when one believes or could reasonably believe that salmon has been illegally fished. So if you're basically uh, selling salmon or in possession of salmon, which um, we could reasonably believe to have been illegally caught or illegally fished, then that's illegal. So actually, it's... Not that surprising or strange. It's just the use of the word in suspicious circumstances. To handle salmon. So handling could mean possessing, selling, buying, but yeah. it also could just mean holding it. So that's the funny part. Of Fondling it. it. Yeah. But as you say, sandal doesn't salmon? Sandal? Salmon doesn't have don't have ghoulies, apparently so. Uh, number 48. Until the late 70s, it was common practice for doctors to give uh, uh, women Guinness. Pregnant women were recommended to drink Guinness in the 70s because of the iron, the high iron content. That can't be true. It's no doctor would recommend a pregnant woman drink Guinness. Alcoholic drinks when pregnant? Absolutely not. Well, this was the 70s and it, this ended in the 70s. True. It's absolutely true. Our mum was made to drink Guinness. She didn't even like it. I don't and think the she was made to drink no, Guinness. No, re- okay, suggested to. And she said she didn't even like Guinness, but she used to drink it anyway because the doctor told her to. Yeah. Not a lot, like well, that, maybe one glass every other day or something. So she did drink alcoholic drinks during pregnancy. Yeah, which, but just one. That tells you everything you need to know, doesn't it, listeners, really? That explains a lot. Number 49, until 1968, tobacco was commonly included in a child's packed lunch. 
along with bread, dripping and tripe. Uh, a packed lunch, we understand. Uh, bread, we understand. Fat drippings, that's just like f- uh, fat that's dripped off some meat. Uh, dripping, fat drippings. And tripe is sort of meat that comes from the intestines of an animal. I think Yuck. it's the stomach lining, actually, of a cow. Stomach lining, is it? Very of, cheap, very cheap meat sort of stuff. St- off, awful. It's absolutely awful, isn't it? Hey. Uh, hey. I made this one up. It's false. Awful is is just like um, yeah, stuff like intestines and stomach linings. The sort of stuff you get in horrible sausages, but it's not true at all. So kids were not given. To- here's your packed lunch, little Johnny. Here's your bread. Here's your fat drippings. Here's your tripe, and here's a little pouch of tobacco for you. No, of course not. I have seen a child rolling up cigarettes and smoking them extremely proficiently. Really, I think he was a, a gypsy child. And I saw him at the skate park once, and uh, he was like young, maybe ten. Wow! And he was rolling his own and smoking them like well. And it looked like he'd been doing it for a few he years. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow! Fancy that, eh, listeners? All sorts of fun facts and interesting tidbits of interesting information. I said interesting twice. Oh dear. And then finally, number 50, until 1982, all buses and taxis were legally obliged to carry a bottle of brandy to revive any passengers taken ill during the journey. This is straight up bullshit. It's not true. (laughs) Just to be clear. Um, No, they weren't. But this is the sort of thing you read in Sherlock Holmes stories. It's the kind of thing they used to say when someone fainted, they'd give them brandy to revive them. Yeah. In those sorts of 19th century Victorian stories, you, there's always a character who has who has brandy for like medicinal purposes. Yeah. As if it's like something that will wake you up. When someone faints or falls to her, uh, uh, when someone faints, they're always given brandy to revive well, they them. They used to give brandy to um, people with hypothermia who'd been in, you know, snowy conditions. And they reckon now it might have killed a few people because what you want is warmth and to maybe sip some... Some warm water. Yeah. Not drink brandy, because it'd be quite a shock to the system, you know. Alcohol apparently lowers the body temperature, so it's not... Right. It's, it it may be. make you feel like you're hot, but you're actually not Yeah. getting warm. You're burning up more of your energy. Mm. So it's actually a terrible... I mean, they, they, they've they got these dogs with a brandy barrel around their necks, right? The St. Bernard's. St. Bernard's in, in ski, ski... Yeah, ski areas. I don't know if they're still in use. <laughs> I don't to be know honest. they should be. But yeah, you do. That's a sort of traditional thing that, like these Saint Bernard dogs with a little barrel of brandy, <laughs> brilliant, uh, and to rescue any people who got lost in in the mountains or something, and brilliant, it might be really cold. Like, don't worry, here's some brandy for you. <laughs> so there you go, listeners. Just in case you feel like you didn't learn anything useful from this episode, if you're really cold, don't actually drink brandy. It's uh, uh, according to our limited scientific knowledge of the subject, that it won't actually help you. And there you go. So, thank you so much for listening all the way through. Um, so Jack- that was about a third too long. Well, yeah, but you always say that in these situations. <laughs> and it's free. Hey, you get this podcast for free. Get what you pay for, don't you? And more. Yeah, so there you are, listeners. Okay, James, thank you so much for taking That's part. Right. I quite enjoyed making up some of the silly questions. Yes, it was good fun, wasn't it? Hopefully not more fun than it was to actually listen back to this mm. conversation later. Mm. But, you know, we can't be the judge of that, can we? No. Only the no. listeners can. Only God can, Only God can judge me. Only God can judge us now. Okay, all right, good. Let's stop this and go downstairs and join everyone else. Be sociable. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Nice to be on your podcast again, Luke. Pleasure. Come back again Cheers. soon. All right. Cheers. See you, people. Bye. So that's it, listeners. Thanks again to my brother for his contribution to this episode and the previous part as well. Thank you to James. And also, thank you to you for listening. Don't forget, you can read all those facts on the page for this episode on my website. Why would you want to read them? Not just because they are so interesting, but it just could be a good way to check some of the words and phrases that you heard in this episode, okay? lots of words and phrases. There might be some things that you don't know. In fact, I'm sure there's some new vocabulary in there. Like this, here's here's a selection of words that you heard. So if things like this, puritanical, richly flavoured, a pathway to sin, 
a suit of armour, gas, wind or a fart, to keep something in reserve, a body of water, a bale of hay, a muzzle or to keep an animal muzzled, to handle something, fat drippings, tripe, to be taken ill and to revive someone. So that's just a selection. I'm not going to go into all of that now, but you could pursue that vocabulary and research it and try to remember it and use it, or at least just try to notice it again as you listen, read and generally come into contact with English. I find that sometimes when you, hmm, when you haven't been sort of formally introduced to a word, I mean, when someone hasn't said, oh, hey, look at, these, look at this phrase. Did you know this? This is what it means. And look, this is how it's used. When if someone hasn't done that for you, if you haven't specifically noticed a word or phrase, then when you're listening and reading, sometimes those bits of vocabulary just pass you by. You don't notice them. You know, it's like, especially if you're listening or especially listening, if you're listening to English and you don't understand 100% of it, you understand, I don't know, 60, 70, 80% or more, anything up to 99% or something, if you don't understand everything, sometimes the words and phrases that you don't know, um, they kind of pass you by. You know, you try your best to understand everything, but there are just some bits of English that you probably just don't even notice. You don't see. They're kind of invisible because you haven't been introduced to them formally. Am I making sense? I hope so. Um, so sometimes all it takes is for you to kind of Ah, notice a word like, oh, oh, okay, what, what's that? What's that phrase? What's that word? And you see it written down and maybe you check it, you know, you look it up in online dictionaries and have a look and, and look at the examples of that word or phrase that you find in those dictionaries, or maybe do other kinds of searches like a Google News search with the phrase in speech marks. And you kind of have a look at the way it's being used uh, there. And then you've got to know the word, you've been introduced to it, the word or phrase. And then you'll find that you'll probably spot that word or phrase being used again and again. It's no longer invisible for you. And suddenly you notice it again and again. And, and then it's everywhere. Now, this has been... I've talked about this phenomenon on the podcast before. Ages ago, long-term listeners might remember a conversation I had with Amber about this. Um, where Amber was saying that she noticed like a new word that came up. That's it. We were doing, I did a text detective story with Amber and Paul. And in that story, there were a couple of words that came up that we were like, huh? Like the word burlap. This is the, this is the reference that I always make in when I'm talking about this kind of thing. Burlap sack came up in the story. And we were like, burlap? And it's, it's a type of material, a rough kind of material that's used um, to make a sack, like for a sack of potatoes or something. We would, in English, in British English, we probably would say hessian. But burlap is also a word that's used. It's just that we weren't familiar with it. So we were like, huh, burlap. And we worked it out that it was like a material for making sacks. And then Amber, I saw her again and she said, you know what, I keep reading the word burlap everywhere because Amber reads a lot a lot of books about history and the history of Paris and suddenly everything that she read contained a reference to a burlap sack. It's, it's just funny the way it goes. And other things were in that conversation. We also talked about like gaslighting. Gaslighting, which is now a word that you come across all the time. You know, it just means sort of manipulating someone by making them think that they're going crazy. It's the sort of thing that happens in couples, you know, in a marriage when the marriage has gone wrong and the the husband and wife it's there's an there's it's become an abusive relationship, a bit like the Johnny Depp Amber Heard situation. And one of them starts gaslighting the other one. That means manipulating them by convincing them that they're crazy, like doing all sorts of manipulative behaviour that makes the person question their own judgment and their own sanity. Gaslighting. You might have heard about it, but uh, a few years ago, the word wasn't used very much, but it came up in a conversation with Amber and Paul. 
I think it was in the Collins words of the year or something when that word had just started being used. It was trending. And it was we talked about it. It was a fairly new word. And then after the conversation, the three of us kept noticing the word all the time. Maybe it's because that word suddenly started trending. Um, not because we used it, but just because it was trending in the world. Imagine that. Imagine if I had that much influence. I just like introduce a new word and suddenly everyone's using it. I don't think so. But um, anyway, the point is that you notice a word, you kind of get to know it and suddenly you're much more able to notice it again and again and again. And you do notice it again and again and again. And then, you know, you've broken new ground. You've kind of uncovered yet more of the language. And as you uncover it, you are able to see it more and hear it more and then use it. It's a bit like if you're playing a computer game like Grand Theft Auto. When you start the game, the map that you have of the world is all dark. It's all black. You, you can't see any of the areas in the map. But then in the game, as you explore the different parts of that world, those parts of the map become uncovered. They're no longer dark. It all becomes uncovered until eventually, when you've explored the entire map, explored the entire world, and then you look at the map, it's all visible. You can see all of it. It's kind of similar with English or with language learning, I think, that in order to, let's say, um, have the option to go anywhere in the language, you need to have uncovered it all first. Um, so, you know, what am I saying? Taking a bit of extra time to check words that you might have missed or that you might have not understood and just kind of, you know, forgotten about. Taking a little bit of time to uncover those new things can make a big difference. It can help you uncover the language. So all those words like puritanical, richly flavoured, some of these words you'll know, you know, I'm not saying they're all brand new to you, but still, richly flavoured, a pathway to sin, a suit of armour, gas or wind, as words meaning uh, farts, you know, they're like uh, euphemisms for a fart, gas or wind. Yeah, you know, these, this language has got different levels, some of it's more formal, some of it's more sort of... Uh, I don't know, some of it's more just funny language. Um, to keep something in reserve, a body of water, a bale of hay, a muzzle, to keep an animal muzzled, to handle something, fat drippings, tripe, to be taken ill and to revive someone. Now, some of those things are more frequently used than others. I don't know, for example, how often you will need to talk about tripe or bales of hay in your life, I don't know what you do. If you are a farmer, then I suppose bales of hay will be a thing. Or if you are just at least in the countryside, bales of hay might come up. Or tripe, if you're talking about certain types of food, you know, tripe might come up. Um, but anyway, so th that's the thing. As I've said, the thing about pushing your vocabulary beyond the intermediate plateau, you have to go beyond the limits of the vocabulary that you come across on a daily basis and go into the more uncharted areas of English in order to open things out and expand. Also, uh, I explained some other vocabulary at the end of part one of this double episode. I don't know if you heard that, but I went into uh, various words relating to laws, rules, regulations, government legislation, and so on, as quite a lot of those uh, bits of vocab came up in the 50 facts that James and I listed here. So go back and listen to the last 30 minutes of part one of this if you haven't already done so. You see, it pays to listen to episodes all the way until the end, doesn't it? You might see an episode and see an ep the length of the episode and think, oh my God, it goes on forever. But sometimes it's just because the last 30 minutes are where I kind of go through some of the language that's come up. All right. So, you know, if you see an episode that's two hours long, it might be two hours of rambling, but also it might be an hour or an hour and a half of rambling and then 30 minutes of sort of language teaching or language remembering. Yeah. 
Okay, a little note about premium, LEP premium, just to remind you, LEP premium is a thing. How does it work? Basically, you can sign up to LEP premium now through Acast Plus. And when you sign up, okay, uh, and you, you get a monthly subscription to it, you then are able to add all the premium episodes into the episode list in your podcast app. And that's like any normal podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, Overcast, CastBox, Pocket Casts. You can now get LEP premium episodes in your normal podcast list in your app, which is pretty convenient. And in the um, descriptions, in the show notes of those premium episodes, you can easily access the PDFs and also videos if there are video versions of them available. Okay, so you can you can suddenly expand your episode list uh, significantly by adding all those premium episodes into it. And those episodes all focus very specifically on vocab, grammar and pronunciation. Okay, that's where I get into the nitty gritty of the language and I actually break it all down for you and do my very best to help you understand, uh, learn, remember and use all that target language. Okay, that's where, for example, the, I could go through with that list of things I've just mentioned to you there and really introduce all that language to you properly so that you really get the full details and you've hopefully used it all, you've pronounced it all, the 360 degrees of, of all that vocab. That's the idea with the premium stuff. And if you want to get started, just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium uh, yeah, that's it. teacherluke.co.uk slash premium. And that's how you sign up and then add the episodes to your app. And just go to forward slash premium info to get more information. Okay, right. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. And I will speak to you again in some form on the podcast. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.